things are not always as they seem. Things are not always what they seem. The first appearance deceives many. The intelligence of a few perceives what has been carefully hidden. Goes an old saying. Things are not always what they seem. Someone seems to be leaking classified information, which sounds a little bit like current news if you've been paying much attention to things happening in this country. Seems like somebody's leaking some classified information, but we're going to find out as we look in 2 Kings 6. That's not really the way things are. A devastating defeat at the hands of a large and superior army seems almost certain, except that's not how things turn out. I want you to hang on to this phrase, and in fact, I'm going to ask you whenever we mention it, because we're going to mention it often, you may want to repeat it with me, because I sure want this point to be able to come across to us this morning. It is the title, Things Are Not Always What They Seem. And I encourage you to say that with me whenever we come across that phrase. Things are not always what they seem. Second Kings chapter 6, verses 8 to 11. Now the king of Syria was warring against Israel, and he counseled with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. The man of God, and I'll let you in on a secret, when it says man of God, it's referring to Elisha, prophet. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down here. The king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Now the heart of the king of Syria was enraged over this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you tell me which of us is for the king of Israel? You kind of catch the story here. There is the king of Syria who's fighting against Israel. And it seems like the battle plans are leaking out. Somehow, the king of Israel knows the battle plans of the king of Syria. And so he finds out that whatever he's planning gets foiled somehow. And so you see, he asks that question of his insiders. Hey, who's on the side of Israel? So in essence, who's the inside mole in my, uh, in my team here? Which again, might sound a little bit like what's going on in government right now. So this is potentially a high treason crime. Somebody on the inside is giving away some confidential information. That's how it seems to be. But things are not always as they seem. Always what they seem. You got it right and I didn't. <laughs> so verse 12. So he said to them, go and see where he is. Wait a minute. Back up a minute. Uh, verse, yeah, I read verse 13, did that? Verse 12, one of his servants said, No, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. That's an amazing thing. So it's not like there's somebody uh, inside the military that's leaking secrets over to Israel. That's not what's going on. They're learning about what's going on, but in a different way. The man of God, Elisha, supernaturally empowered, as a matter of fact, state, literally is hearing the words that the king of Syria is speaking in his bedroom. And so that may well be the very first case of a bugging device ever being planted, except it wasn't electronic. It was spiritual. So, verse 13. So he said, go and see where he is, that I may sin and take him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. 
Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city, and his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? I just love stories where it's so dramatic that defeat seems almost certain. You know, the good guys are just on the verge of a terrible defeat, and that's the way things look. Because here's Elisha and his servant and the people of God, and they're surrounded by this great army. And so it seems like something really bad is about to happen. But you just know there's got to be an 11th hour solution. And indeed, there is. So verse 16. So he answered, Elisha answered the servant, and he says, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. From all appearances, Elisha has lost his mind. The city is circled by a huge army of Syrians. And so it looks like defeat is absolutely certain. But yet, he makes this statement, don't be afraid because the one who's with us, those that are with us are more than those that are with them. The odds appear to be heavily against Elisha and his servant, but things are not always what they seem. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Romans 8, 31. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, verse 4. This verse I just absolutely love, verse 17. Then Elisha prayed, and he said, O Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha prays, God, open his eyes. Open the eyes of the servant. Of course, the servant wasn't blind. He could see, but he couldn't really see. He couldn't see what Elisha could see through eyes of faith. Open his eyes that he might really see. And when I think about that, and I think about making that personal as I have as I've studied this passage throughout this past week, I wonder what it is that I don't see that I need to see. I wonder what it is that we don't see that God wants for us to be able to see. What hidden reality are we missing? The reality that's there that we just don't see. The reality that would change everything. In what ways do we need to have our eyes opened? Mark chapter 9, verses 22 to 24. The father of a demon-possessed boy said to Jesus, If you can do anything, Take pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. What an odd statement. I can see, but there's a whole area that I don't see, and I, I want you to help me to believe and to see the possibilities. And so when I come back to what Elisha prayed for his servant, open his eyes that he might see. Well, that's an important prayer for each of us. God, I want my eyes opened. I want my eyes opened in faith to see the reality that's really there that I'm missing otherwise. So it says that the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. Wow, did he see? He had been seeing this great Syrian army around the city, a formidable force. And all of a sudden, can you just picture being there? All of a sudden, after Elisha has prayed, he opens his eyes and he sees not the Syrian army. Yeah, they're there. But he sees a greater army on the hills around them. 
He sees that there's a far superior army around this formidable army that seems to have surrounded the city. Can you imagine how the servant felt and how he reacted when he was able to finally see for the first time in a very real way? Where before, no doubt he had been defeated because of how things appeared. And now when he sees the greater army, the Lord's army, can you imagine how confident and a sense of victory welled up within him? And so he went from being a downtrodden, defeated man to now seeing the possibilities because he saw God's army. Wow. And how would it be for us to look at circumstances like that and to feel so very defeated and beaten down and all of a sudden to have our faith lifted literally by the sight that we can see of God's presence and God's work and God's army. What was it that made the difference? It was a prayer that was prayed by Elijah. Because as I, I read this, I realize nothing actually changed. None of the circumstances changed. The servant saw what he thought were the real circumstances, namely a, a great imposing army surrounding the city. What he didn't know about, what he didn't see, was there's another army there. It had been there. Elisha had seen it. Nothing had changed except that prayer made a difference in terms of his perspective. Prayer changed his perspective. I submit to you that most often that's what prayer does for us. Many times circumstances don't change. Things remain the same, but this is the, the powerful thing about prayer. It changes our perspective. We see things in a different way than we saw them before. It opens our eyes to see possibilities that we didn't see before. And so prayer so often doesn't just change circumstances. It's been said that prayer changes things, and sometimes it does indeed. Sometimes what prayer changes are not the circumstances, but our view of the circumstances. Wednesday nights, our midweek Bible studies, we've been looking at the book of Hebrews. This week, we look at, I think, the most exciting chapter in all the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. By faith, by faith, by faith, time and time again, it talks about things that were done by faith, by people who had their eyes open to the possibilities through faith. And boy, if you want to get a faith lift, come out and study with us, or at least get some time in Hebrews 11 and look at that great chapter, because it's an exhilarating look at the possibilities that come about through faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. Hebrews 11, verse 6. What is it that faith does? Faith opens our eyes. Faith opens our eyes to see the invisible God. The God that we cannot physically see, but faith allows us to see Him. And to see Him who is the rewarder of those who seek Him out. And indeed He is. God rewards us as we seek Him out. But faith opens our eyes to see Him and to see the possibilities that are Him. So thinking up back in our story with verse 18, it says that when they came down to him, that, that great army of the Lord, when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people with blindness, I pray, the Syrian army. So he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man you see." And he brought them to Samaria. And when they had come into Samaria, Elisha said, oh Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. I like this frequent mention of blindness and sight. Kind of an interesting theme throughout this story. And so previously, Elisha prayed for his servant. Open his eyes that he could see. And so now here's the Syrian army bent on their destruction and defeat. And so Elisha prays to the Lord and says, Blind him. 
help them that they don't see. And so he basically took a whole army by the hand and said, hey, this isn't the place you want to be. This is not the city. This is not the person you're looking for. He led them out to Samaria, which I think I heard was like about 16 miles away. Led them a distance away to Samaria. Now open their eyes. And their eyes were opened and they realized they were a far cry from where they started out. They were no longer in that region about to do this terrible thing to the people of God. Almost as a footnote, verse 23 says, And the marauding bands of Syria did not come again into the land of Israel. I want to say, well, duh. After all those things happening, of course they wouldn't. They had seen the mighty hand of God at work, opening eyes and, and, and blinding eyes and so forth. They, they had seen some tremendous things happen. I'm pretty sure they were shaking in their boots and decided, you know, it might be a good idea that we don't go back there again. Maybe we'll go out and raid other peoples and other cities, but we're not going back there again. God prevailed on behalf of His people. Things that were done through faith and through real sight that comes through faith. I was thinking a few years ago, there was a song that we were singing in a vacation Bible school. Linda, you probably remember this one. It went like this. When I think about your ways, Lord, it gives me so much faith in all that you do. Faith to see beyond what I can't see. Faith to know that you will do great things. I will trust you, Lord. I'll always believe as I hold on my faith. Great song about faith and the possibilities. Faith to see beyond what I can't see. Faith to know that you will do great things. The challenge before us today is for these to be more than just words to a song. To see that which would be unseen to us except that we would see it through eyes of faith, even as Elisha's servant was able to see. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1. Again, faith sees what would otherwise be hidden. Because things are not always what they seem. Indeed. There is a saying coined by Jordan Bernard Shaw that was modified and used quite often by Robin Kennedy. Some men see things as they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. That's what faith does. That's what eyes of faith allow us to see and to do. To not bemoan things as they are. But instead, to look at things that perhaps don't exist, but can exist in the realm of faith. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, according to Acts 2.17, quoting from the book of Joel. We live in the age of the spirit. The age of faith, whereby God's Spirit manifests itself through dreams and through visions, opening the eyes of the people of God to see that unseen realm that can again only be visible by faith, inspiring us, His people, to dream dreams and to see visions about what can be for the work of God. Open His eyes that He may see. And it says, the Lord opened his servant's eyes, and he saw. I don't know about you, but this story just causes me to have faith well up with him because I want to see through eyes of faith. I want us to see. I want us to see beyond the apparent reality. And I want us to see to, to that which God has for us, the people of God, and for us individually. There's an old Chinese proverb that says it is better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. There are plenty of people that look at darkness that surrounds us today. What seems to be a dark reality for the Christian faith and for the church. They look at the impact of Christianity and the church and they see it declining. They see there's less influence. They see less people going to church than there once was. And they label it a post-Christian age. And by 
so doing, I believe they are cursing the darkness. It is not for us to do that. We don't curse the darkness. We light a candle of faith so that we can see and so that others can see. It's not that dark of a world that God has done working in the world. Has God given up on the world? I don't think so. Has Jesus Christ given up on his church in this age? Far be it. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Your eyes of faith. We need to see what God sees. We need to see what Jesus our Lord sees, because things are not always as they seem. It's not that great of darkness. It's a time for brightness through faith. Again, open his eyes, open her eyes, open our eyes, that we might see. The Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. So what is faith opening our eyes to see? I believe and I trust the great things. Specifically, our elders in another month are going to go off on a weekend retreat to focus on faith vision for the future of this church. <clears throat> what I want you to think about and what I'd like to encourage you to share with your elders before they do that is what is it that you have seen in faith for Lecture sure Bible Church and for our impact in this community and beyond? What is it that the elders need to know and hear from you before they go off and do that kind of envisioning and planning? I want to encourage you to share those dreams, those things you're seeing with eyes of faith. I want you to share those things with them before that happens. Faith opens our eyes not only to what this body of believers can do, but to see our lives and what can happen so much more within our personal lives. Can we see victory in our lives by being able to see through eyes of faith, to see us overcoming negative and detrimental habits? To see ourselves in certain areas of service, making a real difference for the cause of Christ and the kingdom of God. To see ourselves with a new mindset and a new outlook, replacing one that's maybe a little more negative than we'd like it to be. And we see our lives in the way that God sees us through His Son, Jesus Christ. We need to because things are not always what they seem. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things come. That's the perspective and that's the outlook for us. So much want us to see the eyes of faith. I so much want, like Elisha, to pray for his servant and pray that our eyes are open and to see beyond what might seem like dark and dismal circumstances and to say, we are the people of God. We are empowered and we have within us what he wants to have within us to make a difference in this world. It's not our battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we need to remember that. That's the story that we lived out of, the lesson we lived out of the story today. It was a great battle, but it was the Lord's battle. The Lord brought his army and fought the battle. And so it is with us. The Lord has his army around us, whether we see it or not. The Lord is fighting that battle on our behalf. We just simply engage and follow along. But the battle belongs to the Lord. And I say that because there is no better song for us to, to conclude with today than that song by that title, The Battle Does Belong to the Lord. And I pray that we believe it as we sing.